cancer cells have uh, mutations, and these mutations are, are presented to the surface of the cell, and that allows uh, the immune system, T cells, to target the cancer cell. That would be great if it really worked, but what happens is uh, cancer cells have evolved uh, in response to uh, T cell stimulation. Uh, interferon gamma stimulates a protein known as PDL1 to be made on the tumor cell. This protein acts as a disguiser. It camouflages the, the cancer cell from the immune system because the PDL1 protein on the surface of the tumor cell binds to the T cell and turns off the T cell. Well, one, you know, it's just extraordinary biology to understand that this checkpoint uh, is so important for immune function and that if you release the checkpoint, you then activate the T cells. And I guess the big reason is it's working. And if you look at this meeting, you can see multiple approaches, different antibodies, different companies, slightly different targets. And what you can see is that we are seeing tumors respond in lung cancer and melanoma and renal cancer and head and neck cancer and breast cancer. It's just phenomenal that we're seeing this type of response and these durable responses with uh, a large number of agents. Right, my, my MPDL compound that I'm, uh, that I'm presenting on behalf of uh, a group of investigators, uh, a Genentech Roche compound, actually targets PDL1. So it targets, it targets this disguiser protein on the surface of tumor cells. Well, we did a, this is a phase one trial being presented, 171 patients, uh, 140 patients valuable for efficacy. And we're seeing response rates in the mid 20% range, uh, very durable responses. We're seeing responses in uh, melanoma. We're seeing responses in kidney cancer and lung cancer. Uh, some responses also shown in head and neck cancer uh, as well, colon cancer. And we're actually seeing that uh, these patients are doing well. You know, one concern would be toxicity, and it looks like these agents are very well tolerated. The fact that you can do a phase one study with 140 evaluable patients, seeing response rates in the mid 20% range, seeing toxicity where you know, only four patients had immune-related adverse uh, events, some mild hepatitis or, 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 or other uh, problems, really tells you that we have an agent that's here for the long term. This is an agent where once we identify markers, and I presented some data to show that there is a biomarker, we can, we can target PDL1 in the, in the tumor microenvironment, and that can even make the response rate higher, bring it up to almost 40%. So I think that we now have a whole new class of drugs that's going to be used in a host of solid tumors, and that these drugs can be used either alone or in combination in the future to, to benefit patients. Mm -hmm. Well, you could think about combining it with other targeted therapies. For example, in lung cancer, you would think that you could use it with uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors to target specific pathways that are uh, addicted, such as epidermal growth factor receptor uh, mutated patients or uh, ALK uh, 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 translocated patients. You can also imagine that you might use it with agents that target MEK, for example, which is a very hot topic at this meeting. Uh, the sky's the limit. Uh, also, studies are ongoing with other agents of class looking at the drug with chemotherapy. That's a possibility as well. So I really think that this has opened a whole new avenue. I, I think that in the next few years, we've already seen it for the last two years, immunotherapy is going to be one of the top um, areas of, of, of research. Right. Well, we're seeing such uh, a high response rate. You have to wonder, you know, how many of these patients are getting complete response. I think it's still probably a minority. But, you know, one of the things you never know with these agents is what's left. Is it active tumor or is it just scar tissue? So we're going to need to do more biopsy-based studies to really figure that out. I will tell you, though, that uh, when you have an agent that looks good in advanced disease, the next step is to bring it to earlier stage disease. So I think we're going to start seeing these agents used in the frontline setting in certain cancers or as adjuvant therapy or as maintenance therapy. You know, given the toxicity profile of the MPDL, I would predict in lung cancer, for example, which is the area where I treat patients most often, we're going to start seeing this agent in the first line metastatic setting in the stage three patients you know, who have locally advanced um, uh, uh, lymph nodes. Those patients you know, are cured, but to a small extent, maybe we can increase that cure rate by using the agent early, preventing tumor progression and metastases. These are all questions that remain to be asked. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's one of the concerns uh, of toxicity. But the, the nice thing about the MPDL is it targets the tumor cell, the PDL1, and it actually leaves PDL2, which is on many of the normal cells of the body, intact. And many think that PDL2 might be involved in uh, dampening the immune system in response to inflammation. And the hope would be that there'd be less autoimmunity and, and fewer side effects. It's too soon to tell that in an early phase trial. But all the data so far are consistent with that fact. 
Well, as someone like myself who sees many patients, they come in, uh, they've failed multiple prior therapies, the median number of prior therapies in my trial was uh, upwards of two. Um, I now have a weapon to offer them, something that can make them uh, feel better, their tumor shrinks, hopefully they live longer. It's, it's very promising. It, it makes my day much uh, better because I'm helping more people.